16 years ago, during my first Mass, it was also on Trinity Sunday, um, I was ordained with two other Jesuits. And on Trinity Sunday, Matt explained the Trinity. Roger tried to explain the Trinity. And I just talked about something else. So we'll see if that works again today. Because it's a lot different today than it was in the year 400. That was about 1,600 years ago. We know a bit about it because we have the writings of St. Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory reported, it was impossible to go into a marketplace to exchange or to buy bread. Imagine this. You could not go into a marketplace without getting into a discussion or even into an argument with merchants or other shoppers about, and I quote, this is from the writings of St. Gregory, you could not get into an argument about whether God the Son is subordinate to God the Father, whether Christ is begotten or unbegotten, whether he had been created or was an ordinary human being. That's what people were talking about 1,600 years ago. St. Gregory could not understand this inordinate enthusiasm for what he called divine things, and wondered whether this was a result of, quote, perversity or delirium or insanity or some other kind of evil that produced derangement. In other words, why were so people so into the question of who God was and how best to understand this God? People were talking and fighting about this in the public arena, trying to understand the nature of the Trinity, much like one might discuss politics in a coffee shop with them friends or frenemies today. It's hard to imagine what St. Gregory was talking about since the doctrine of the Trinity, if not ignored or misunderstood, usually suffers from what we might call benign neglect. I heard once a religious studies teacher try to explain to his students in mathematical terms and wrote on the board, God plus God plus God equals God. And I looked at the class and they all looked back with blank expressions. And yet we continue to begin and pray every prayer, every single prayer, with a Trinitarian formula. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we do it without thinking. We baptize, and therefore we initiate people into our religious community using that formula. The very first thing you do as a Christian, the very thing that makes you a Christian which we have in common with all of our Protestant and Orthodox brothers and sisters, is that we are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we do not believe in some God in general, and also a trinity, nor do we believe in Jesus as separate from God, because our God is the God of Jesus Christ, and yet Jesus Christ is also our God. <laughs> Try to explain that to your fourth grader. So what I'm trying to do really isn't about attempting to produce a comprehensive explanation of who God is, simply because I don't think that's possible. God who is infinite will always be a mystery. What we are trying to do when we speak of the Trinity, today especially on Trinity Sunday, is to remind ourselves of just how inadequate our ideas of God really are. Because no matter what we discover, or no matter what we understand, or no matter what kind of good explanation we can come up with, God is still always totally other. And this is the essence of the mystery that is God. That even though God became part of history and allowed himself to become limited by time and space and the culture of first century Palestine, and even though God enjoyed joy and temptation, suffering and yes, even death, even though God became human, one of us, God remained God. And we still don't know how to fully explain who God is. What we do know is that everything God did and everything God does is done out of love. So I think that fundamentally the Trinity is about a God who is love. The Trinity is about a God who loved us so much that God became one of us so that we in turn could become like God. Those of you who are in love or anyone who has ever been in love, know what this is all about. The more you get to know the people you love, the more you want to know about them. The more in love you are with someone, the more you want to understand the unique mystery that is that person. I think the same is true with God. 
The more of a mystery God is, the closer God is to us. Because we want to know more and more about this God who is love. And if our God is truly the God who is love, who has loved us from the very beginning, who knew us from our mother's wombs, then that love has to elicit a response. And for most people, the response is loving God in return. We were loved first. We love back in response. But this is not the only thing about loving God. Ultimately, it involves falling in love with God. Some of you have heard this quote before. It seems to be repeating, especially these days when violence and poverty are so commonplace in our world. The former superior general of the Jesuits, Father Pedro Arupe, put it this way, and I quote, Nothing is more practical than finding God. That is, than falling in love in a quite absolute final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide what gets you out of bed in the morning, what you will do with your evenings, how you will spend your weekends, what you read, who you know, what breaks your heart, what amazes you with joy and gratitude. So fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. In the end, I think that is God's invitation, and that's the good news. To fall in love, to fall in love over and over again with a God who is love, with a God who loved us first, with a God who keeps inviting us into a relationship of love. And there is nothing more practical, nothing more practical than falling in love.